Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor for me to introduce the next speaker. I have been working together with Bert Mandelbaum, with Jirschid Varjak, and with many others here in the room during many years in the progress of football medicine within FIFA. And I have learned to know, to appreciate, and to admire Bert Mandelbaum. He is the leader of the FIFA Medical Center of Excellence in Santa Monica. He is active in the football world of the United States, in the international football world. He is really also an excellent person to give a conference, and I congratulate Stefano de la Villa to have chosen him to present here a presentation about Mandit like Beckham, the power of progression. Bert, you have the floor. What a great morning being here in the House of Football in Wembley. Unbelievable. But before we get started, by a show of cheers, I want to know how many of you are for Team England. Team England, cheers. <laughs> Team Italy. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Team France. <laughs> Team USA. <laughs> much better than I ever anticipated. I thought it was going to be much better for Team England, of course. But again, this session is really about stories. And like any story, the story starts with once upon a time. And once upon a time, there was a wizard who comes from not far from here in London. His name, David Beckham. And people followed him, men, and of course women, all over the world and cheered him and watched him and thought about him as a wizard. And he was, for so many different reasons. And I want to welcome you to David Beckham. David Beckham, the wizard. And again, it starts here, our story, right here at Wembley, May 28, 2008, which is really the second time I came to Wembley with the U.S. national team. That particular time, David Beckham was receiving an award for his 100th cap. What an auspicious day. But again, it was England 2-0. Three times in a row, 2-0. And unfortunately, David Beckham did this. Hitting it to Terry, and the beginning of the end for the U.S. team. But it's amazing here at Wembley what it's about. Wembley is really had been the exhibition area for the British Empire as it started in 1923. We know subsequently football was a big thing here. As we saw in that same year, the FA Cup final between Bolton and West Ham. And then we had the opportunity and see in 1948, the Olympic Games, and 1966, the World Cup, right here at Wembley. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, what's the connection? What's the link between the sport of life, the British Empire, and the life of sport? How do we think this way? Why are we here today at Wembley once again to think about this? And the answer is, we are all athletes. We're all athletes living out our lives in such a way, when we look at the origins of this, we have to look to Africa, which is the setting for the long dawn of Darwinian evolution. And just four million years ago, we looked like this, Australopithecus. Mm -hmm. Two million years, we looked like this, Homo erectus. And 150,000 years ago, we became Homo sapiens. Interestingly enough, at that time, we were prey. 
we were not predators. And only 100,000 years ago, we became hunter-gatherer predators. Interestingly enough, when you go today to Botswana, you find the Kosan Bushmen, who every day through their hunt, go out and find their bounty. And we learn that these are the athletes. These are the survivors of the fittest. And in fact, the sport of life is linked to the life of sports right here. This is our beginning. We come to our second most important premise. Adversity unleashes the powers of victorious spirit, have you seen in the sessions already. This victorious spirit wells up and we learn, just like at this moment, March 14, 2010, as David Beckman pulls up, he doesn't know what happened. I'm the wizard, how could I be injured? As he steps off, doesn't know what to do, how did I tear my Achilles tendon? As he looks down, he says, Doc, I've torn my Achilles tendon. I need it fixed. I need Alter G, PRP, physical therapy. No, no, maybe three physical therapists, strength and conditioning coaches. They tell me I need a year. I'm going to be back in six months. And in fact, he was. The wizard mended like Beckham. And at six months, he proved another David Beckham in Los Angeles this time that he we were for the championship, the MLS Cup, as Debonair driving his Bentley, and there we are winning our championship. The wizard mended like Beckham. What does he have? What's this magic that goes through him that we see like this? Well, it appears in different ways at different times. But then again, he was struck by Stuart Pierce, the coach of the Olympic team of 2012, and he really wanted to be on that Olympic team but unfortunately, he was denied. But like the wizard, he turned bad to good, and he became the face of the opening ceremonies. Class, dignity, the wizard succeeded again, mended like Beckham. And other athletes have the same thing. Tim Daggett, the Olympic gold medalist, here he is at the World Championships in Rotterdam. He comes down and watch what happens to that left leg. As he called and he came to the clinic after x-ray, his fracture looked like that. He says, Doc, the contraption, the external fixator, the compartment syndrome, arterial injury, my bone is broken, the Olympic trials are in seven months. I can do it. If you dare to dream, Doc, I can get it done. Well, we proceeded the Olympic trials as he said he can do it, he can do it, and we made it to the Olympic trials, but he failed by one point. One point, he was victorious, but he could not get back. The same thing inside him that welled up, this victorious spirit, we see in so many individuals. Cliff Meidel, just an ordinary 20-year-old, burned, 50,000 volts went through his body, burned his shoes, his heart stopped and took half his knees. And he was a special guy, and at the same time, he was in rehab clinic with Tim Daggett, and he learned something about himself. So, what do you do? He started paddling and paddling and paddling until in 1996, he made the Olympic team. The most amazing thing, he'd never been an athlete, but now he became an Olympic athlete with those injuries. And he said, Doc, how do I do it? I said, just keep doing it, Cliff, and he did. To the point, here you see him carrying the American flag in 2000 in Sydney. What an amazing moment. He could barely walk, yet carries the flag for the Olympic team. Special situations. And then there's Charlie Davies, the U.S. national team. He goes to the left, he scores, he outruns. He was a phenomena, maybe the best potential goal scorer we've ever had for the U.S. He went behind curfew one night, drinking, and his car ended up like this. Multiple polytraumatic injuries. Six weeks later, he came to the clinic. And he says, Doc, it's six weeks. I've had dislocation of my knee. I've had all these fractures. But guess what? I'm going to do it. And he did. Coming back from adversity in amazing ways, Charlie Davies. And don't forget about Tiger Woods. 114 victories he had. 114 worldwide. The third best in Europe, of course. And then his back started bothering him, his knees started bothering him, and he got into all kinds of issues 
at home. He lost his way. He began having problems on medications. And then he looked like this, unfortunately. There he is, DUI, stop at that particular point. Just two years ago, two years ago this happened. But what an amazing athlete, a wizard in his own way. There you see, May 29th, 2017. And just two years, he has his mojo back, back at the Masters, and we all know what happened on this putt of 18. He's 14 strokes below par. He hits the putt, and once again, we see this amazing athlete with the victorious spirit. So what do all these people have in common? Why can't we bottle it? Which comes to our third premise. How do we empower? That's empower us to discover that the win is always within. Well, I'm going to leave you with five principles, which are really important. Very important take home messages. Number one, it's about the details that you've heard from the previous talks. You're only as strong as your weakest link going forward. And always, as Malcolm Gladwell has given us, hard work works over and over. Number two, optimism. We know this great story of Ernest Shackleton in 1914. He took 27 men to Antarctica. And there they were, stuck on the ice for two years with 27 dogs, 27 men, and he brought them all back alive. And when he came back here to London, they asked him the question, Sir, how did you do it? And he raises his hand, he says, optimism got us through overall. And this optimism is a character trait in all people that is consistently as you see it. Winston Churchill gave us the pessimist sees difficulty in every opportunity, and guess what? The optimist sees opportunity in every difficulty. And remember, this is what they call believernomics, a new term empowers you to see things differently because of this optimism. And we've seen this in different ways. World Cup 2001, US team, Tim Howard makes the save. Landon Donovan takes off by the field. The Algerians can't keep up with him. He just runs down the field looking for his opportunity. The optimist, the ball falls right in front of him. And he scores louder, please, with the sound. You could not write a script like that. We lose or tie, we go home, we win, we win the group. The 91st optimism when all your lives are so difficult, it doesn't look good, it's the end of the day, in the 91st minute you could win. Maintaining optimism. And Bill Clinton in the locker room right after raised his finger and he said, boys, you did well because we were optimistic. Optimism overall. Number three, how do we innovate? The key to it all, as you've seen from Bert and other talks previously, introducing you to Dr. Joseph Lister from Glasgow, 1865. He took care of these young children as they fractured their femurs, these open femur fractures, and all these young children would die because of infection. And one day in the operating room, one of the residents looks up and says, why does it smell like this? And he thought to himself, the resident, and he interacted about this putrid smell. And he says, well, I've just read this article about this man, this chemist in France, Louis Pasteur, who has been working with cheese and milk, et cetera, and so forth. Let's go visit him. They, three weeks later, they're in Paris, describing the story. Louis Pasteur says, ah, it sounds so interesting. Let's go see my friend in Hamburg, Friedlieb Ferdinand Rungi, has been working with carbolic acid. He says, well, maybe we can kill these bacteria like this with carboxylic acid. They go back to Glasgow, a young child, eight years old, and they find that this boy at this time did not die of infection after open femur fracture and published this in The Lancet. An English Scotsman going to a Frenchman going to a German, working together from different disciplines, innovating a new technology, and it's where we are today in our operating rooms. Number four, compassion. 
You're looking at Margaret Mead, the favorite anthropologist to most, who studied Samoans over the years, and what she found that in the upper Paleolithic period, the Stone Age, 50 to 50,000 years to 15,000, the only femurs she found were broken. They were all broken. None were healed. And then at 15,000 years, she found that she, there were healed femur fractures. And based on this, the anthropological conclusion was we as human beings discovered compassion and care because we took care of that person. We provided food and shelter for them. And from that point on, it was about compassion and care. Number five, relationships and life is a team sport. As we know in Zulu, Ubuntu, I am because you are. We have a team and we look to a team as there are no lone wolves in humanity. And in fact, when you look at this patient of mine, Mr. President Reagan, and I'd have always discussions with him as he in rehabilitation, and he became a friend over time, as he said, my pal Bert. And <clears throat> one of my great uh, mementos, and I asked him, Mr. President, what is the most important thing in your life? Here it is, you were dealing with the Cold War, we we're dealing with Gorbachev, and he said the most important thing in life is understanding relationships. He said, Gorby and I, we developed this friendship. We would hug, we'd look at each other, we would talk, we would laugh. The leaders of the world going to war with one another, and they solved the problem through good relationships. And for us here today, relationships are key because we believe that there's one world and one medical team. Wherever we are, the interrelationships between our athletes, our coaches, our agents, our physical therapists, exercise physiologists, all of it are part of our team. One world, one medical team. I'd like to also welcome you here where the sport of life and the lives of sport intersect. And to appreciate that we all continue to mend it like Beckham. Thank you. Thank you.